Hello, I'm Sonny Landon. Dana, that is yeah. that is one of my favorite Rocky Erickson songs, and I uh -huh. can't think of anything better to kind of lead us into this show. It's Thursday night, and I just, I don't know, I got a wild hair up my ass and was like, why not just do a show <laughs> about hen and lauder, since nobody ever seems to do a show about hen and lauder, and they I don't. don't know why that is, but for those that don't know, I'm Uncle Bill, and this is Evil Dead Chick a.k.a. Dana, and we are going to be talking about uh, one of, in my opinion, the most underrated and unsung um, genre filmmakers that's that's out there. What say you, Dana? I would agree with that, and uh, I don't know if you met, ever met Hen and Water, uh, but I met him at Cinema Wasteland one year, and he was just one of the coolest guys ever. He was you wouldn't expect him to be so laid back, but he really is. And uh, I would recommend if anybody can, you know, get a chance to meet him, that they definitely go up and do so because he's a, a really interesting guy. Um, and he did uh, sign a copy of uh, Basket Case on Blu-ray. So even when I got my Arrow release, I kept the other one because it's signed by him. 
No, I've never met. I've never met Hen Lauder. I would love to have met him. But I would say that uh, Cinema Wasteland is probably the only show he does around here anywhere. Because I've probably. never known him to do any of the any of the other ones. Mm-mm. But he seems like the kind of guy that would be pretty cool. Like he, you know, I watched him on uh, Joe Bob when they did Frankenhooker. Yeah. Here recently, and he seemed like he would be super nice. And I think uh, Joe Bob's pretty good friends with Frank Kenan Lauder because I think even back when he was, uh, Joe Bob was doing his show on the movie channel, I think he had Frank Kenan Lauder on there as well. Yeah, I mean, they seem like they would be like yeah, right. two of the same type of person, basically. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, they both love old grindhouse style movies. They both love exploitation. Like, there's no way that uh, that they couldn't get along. So, but the idea for this show is just to talk about his films uh, and talk about some of our favorites. And then at the end of this show, we're going to do what we always do. We're going to rank the movies. And there's not a lot to rank because he didn't make a lot of movies, to be honest. No. There would not be a top ten because I don't think there's ten films <laughs> to rank. Did you know he did several short films, though? But I don't think I've seen any of them. Yeah, I saw something about that when I was uh, looking up like research on him today where he had made a bunch but let's see here, Dan. Let's see who's in the chat. This is hilarious. Right right off the bat. No one will ever let me live this down, by the way. <laughs> that um, <laughs> it says, Uncle Bill is Frank Henlotter as underrated as Argento's Dracula 3D. Um, yes, I think he's more underrated than Dracula 3D, actually. That movie's not that bad, Dana. I don't know it's- what your thoughts are on it. Uh, well, I can't say that I've ever seen it. I think Steve has seen it, but I yeah, haven't. I mean, it it's really not. <coughs> he was in this too, Dan. I forgot about this. So Mayor's on here, Rambo's on here. Mm. Him and Lauder seemed like a nice guy. He was in the VHS documentary Rewind This, which I have seen that. I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah. X-ray Punch is in here. He says that he's never met him, but he's seen him twice at Q and A's in New York. Yeah, well, I mean, New York is kind of the backdrop. For everything that Hen Lauder yes. does. The Speedster Zone? I don't know this one. This is Eddie Gonzalez. Oh, Edward oh. Edward Gonzalez. So, Subjective Perspective Collective's in here. Uh, old Curly Jaws in here, of course. It's always good to have old Curly Jaws in here. <laughs> and looks like a bunch of people are coming in right now, too. Scott's Wrestling Collection. Yeah. I'm all about the giant grasshopper, which I've been told, I've been corrected, that that's actually a giant praying mantis. So, here I the whole time thought it was a giant grasshopper cricket, <laughs> something, but it's a it's a praying mantis apparently. Uh, yeah, Rem- looks like something that he would do. Like Street Trash looks like a movie that Hen Lauder would do. Yeah, it it definitely has his style to it. Yeah, but I think Street Trash was uh, Roy Frumke's, wasn't it? That, which is an interesting. Yeah. He either wrote it or directed it, but he did he's, something with it. Yeah, and he's a guy that was, that was actually a part of Romero's crew mm-hmm. for a long time. Um, but Frank Henlauder, man, I, it seems like the eighties and the early nineties kind of defined. Henning Lauder's career, really. And then after that, nobody ever really... I mean, he didn't make a movie for 14, 15 years, I don't think. Mm -hmm. And so I can kind of see why, you know, nobody really referenced him because he he just didn't stay current or anything. But um, he had such an amazing span there where he did Mm -hmm. three or four films that were like classics, I think. Right, and he didn't burn himself out like some of these other directors that just do a whole bunch of movies at one time. He kind of paced himself, and he uh, he kind of left. It seemed like he left the business at the right time and didn't just try to keep churning things out. From what I've read, too, Dana, he left the business, 
because of Basket Case Three. <laughs> I think and, I heard that. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure if it was because of how that movie turned out exactly, or if it was because of like some sort of meddling by the by the producer. For those people that haven't seen Basket Case Three, it is kind of a mess. It's mm-hmm. kind of a train wreck of a movie, to be honest. And it like is is silly to the point of being absolutely kind of goofy, mm-hmm. and loses like all of the. It loses all of the the kind of exploitation, grittiness of of the movies that were really great that he did. Mm-hmm. It just becomes like a comedy, really. But let's see. All right, Dan. So what was your first kind of um, Hen and Lauder experience, so to speak? I think Basket Case was actually the the first Hen and Lauder movie that I ever watched. And it was probably, like I, like I say a lot of times, it was probably back in my VHS rental days where I saw this freaky looking cover on a VHS and I was like well I gotta take that home and see what that's all about um, oh yeah and that made me a fan of Hen and Lauder's work so you know anything that I saw that had his name on it after that I wanted to try it out and see how it was but I do have a funny story about the first time I had my parents watch Basket Case my <laughs> mom my mom actually didn't mind it that much But my dad was really quiet when it ended. And then all of a sudden he said, Dana, that is the stupidest movie I've ever seen in my (laughs) life. Yeah, I mean, I can can kind of see how people would think all these movies to one degree or another are stupid, yeah. Uh, (laughs) Oh, man. Like, yeah, I think pretty much everybody that grew up around that time period that we did, it's going to be Basket Case, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that's going to be your first kind of like experience i know it was mine too on vhs like back in the day well and i found this dana this is a blast from the past right? i didn't know i had this i don't know where the hell i got it but i've got an old vhs copy oh wow of basket case two and it says screening copy so i don't know if this this these are usually what they gave people at movie stores mm-hmm. to um to watch the film and people guess, like us weren't even supposed to get a host of those things. Right. So, but the cover of this movie, I always remember, or this VHS, like I always remember that mm-hmm. too. Um, and it's just, just one of those ones that's, something about it is just memorable and you always kind of like, if you grew up around this time period, you always remember mm-hmm. these movies in the VHS stores. Um. But yeah, so Basket Case was my first kind of experience on VHS too. And uh, there's certain scenes in that movie that I will always, always remember. And me and Wes just um, just reviewed this movie mm-hmm. like for for the Patreon thing. And so I went back and rewatched it. I don't know if you'd rewatched it lately if you'd already seen it. Um, know. not real recent no it's it still holds up Mm -hmm. to me it does um so i mean it's uh it's a movie kind of made on like the most shoestring budget that you can think of Mm -hmm. for that time period i mean we're talking about a movie made in 1982 here too uh the budget day now i look this up okay Think about this for a second, because this is insane. The budget was $35,000 on that movie. So, (laughs) I mean, that's about as cheap as it gets for making anything on, like, 35 millimeter. Maybe it was made on 60 millimeter. I'm not sure. But either way, like, that's a a really low budget film. Mm -hmm. And um, pretty much from what I can gather... He made it because he knew he could make a movie like that that was like an exploitation style mm-hmm. movie and thought that he could get, you know, kind of, you know, that it, it could get some sort of distribution. I don't think he ever thought it would be popular like it kind of became. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it was shot on 16 millimeter. Okay, that makes okay. sense. Okay, that's what I was thinking, but it yeah. wasn't for sure. I mean, if you got a movie for $35,000, it about has to be shot on 16 millimeter. Come <laughs> think of it. Um, 
but the the centerpiece of that movie for me too was the the background the setting like new york mm -hmm. new york in the early 80s 42nd street um you know hotel broslin yeah right? yeah yeah and that it was just a really good that's the best part of the movie to me now is like how well he captured new york at that time mm -hmm. period yeah it's almost like a a time capsule in a in a lot of ways of what new york was at that time and uh I, I some people might call the like the effects and stuff like that hokey and the stop motion with blow and stuff but i think that just adds to the whole charm of the movie uh to have that kind of stuff in there i would much rather see it like that with the old-fashioned stop motion than for somebody Lord help us, I hope they don't do this, to remake it and like try to put all these digital effects in it because I think they would just destroy it. Somebody will remake it. You know they will. And they'll have like I a know. little CGI uh, blow. Like, <laughs> It'll be awful. Yeah. Be running around. Oh, uh, man. But, okay, so I don't know what version you got, Dana, but uh, this is the version that I've got. I've got the Arrow video Um is that the limited edition? Okay. No, I don't okay. think so. This is this the it says the director approved special edition. Okay. I think so I don't I've, think I think mine might be the limited edition, but it is an arrow release. Yeah, I mean this thing has it does have tons of stuff on it though. It's a 4K restoration. It's um like interviews with all the cast basically, interviews mm -hmm. with the uh, Hen Lauder just tons of shit special feature wise on there too right but um yeah there's a couple movies that have the feel of new york that gritty kind of grimy mm -hmm. uh grindhouse feel and maniac is one of them like dmc mentioned mm -hmm. this is this is one of them basket case is definitely one of them mm -hmm. um just they have that kind of style to them was so anyway, um was cruising was that new york city i feel like it was if it wasn't it felt like it yeah was for that's sure. what that's what i was gonna say yeah but uh so here's the basic plot of the movie dana for those people that haven't seen it which will probably be everybody in here seen this yeah uh there's a dude who was born with a conjoined twin who's this crazy little like I don't know, like, looks like a giant wart that's got arms and, you know, that, that has grown on him and then gets separated by this group of surgeons. And the plot of the movie is that they, the two of them, uh, Kevin Van Hintenreich, whatever his name is, mm -hmm. and little Belial, uh, who's in a basket, which is where basket case comes from. He's, you know, Kevin's walking around with him in a little basket. Um, are going after all these surgeons and doctors and nurses that had anything to do with that surgery that separated mm -hmm. them because they, before that, you know, they had like all this the telekinetic kind of, you know, connection to one another and this mm -hmm. and that too. Um, which is exactly, I've said this before, but it's true. It's exactly the same plot that malignant took, from this movie mm -hmm. and really malignant is the same malignant is like a remake of basket case really if you think about it yeah and one of the uh one of the doctors was not an actual human doctor she was a veterinarian which made it even worse yeah you've got you've got all these cruddy doctors i mean they weren't none of them were good doctors uh, what kind of doctors would that had any morals would do what they were asked to do? But to have a veterinarian in there too is just insane. Yeah, I feel like you got the. I don't know if they directly said this, or you got the impression that like the family kind of had it done under the table, like against their will. Yeah, the father wanted on the. The father wanted them separated because he he just wanted Dwayne. He he didn't even consider Blyle his son. 
And right. I think their mother had died having them during childbirth. But then their their aunt, who ended up raising them later, she was all for both Dwayne and Bilal. Right. I do remember <laughs> that. <laughs> so, <laughs> the movie from that point, um, you know, once you kind of figure out what's going on, it's just a series of crazy ass like death scenes involving Bilal who's the primary like killer in this movie mm -hmm. and so basically he just you know goes around lets his little brother off somewhere at one of these people's like you know either houses or businesses or and then he just goes in there and kills him in some of the most hilarious ways ever <laughs> really my favorite though the one that always stuck with me is there's a scene with one of the I don't know if it's a doctor or a nurse but uh, he like jams her head down into like a, a thing full of oh that's uh, the veterinarian that's is that, that's the veterinarian yeah dr cutter i think and she actually gets cut up pretty bad yeah and then she she comes up screaming and there's like scalpels <laughs> and stuff right. like stuck in her head yeah and there's a lot of scenes like that to where there's a quick cut and then like you see all this kind of damage i guess the special effects budget was pretty limited too mm -hmm. um and there's also a, a kind of a subplot where the main character, I keep calling him uh, uh, Kevin, but it's not Kevin. His name is Dwayne in the movie, mm -hmm. but his, the actor is Kevin Van Hitler, is like wooing this woman, <coughs> which is a big plot point in the film because he's wooing this girl and then Bilal starts to get jealous. <laughs> yeah. And in one of the best scenes in the fucking movie, like wrecks the hotel room that they're staying in, <laughs> and like this fit of rage, and it's just one of the funniest things. Mm -hmm. uh, but here, real quick though, Wes wants to. Wes got a question for you. Did you notice some similarities with this film and the OG Evil Dead? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something, but I can't, <laughs> I can't see a correlation between those two movies. I was thinking, though, like, um, the way it's filmed. Unless it's camera work or something yeah, like, like that. Yeah, like that and just the look of the film where it's 16 millimeter. I think Evil Dead was 16 millimeter, wasn't it? Was Maybe. it 16 millimeter? They both look very, very similar. But as far as plot-wise, I don't really see any similarities. But if you want to compare Hen and Lauder's camera work and Sam Raimi's camera work, it is kind of similar. That crazy, um, just like you said, quick cuts and just the rapid movement of the camera and all that. Yeah. Yeah, the stop motion to him inches. Yeah, they both had stop motion. I think that Basket Case had a lot more like fucking, I don't know, hilarious, noticeable stop motion too. Because <laughs> that whole scene, man, like it's kind of been, uh, it's been redone online and clips have been taken of that scene and, you know, just how laughable it is. I think it's great though. I think it adds to the movie mm -hmm. just about how funny and, and, kind of you know do it yourself that it is too um so of course there's a scene where uh uh Bilal tries to kind of i don't know if he's trying to kill the girlfriend or scare her or i'm not entirely sure like what he's do he sets out to do uh -huh. um or if he's trying to rape her <laughs> i thought he was trying to rape her that's what <laughs> Because there's a scene, I know you probably remember this too, where he gets up onto the bed and everything and his eyes turn like red. And it's just one of the most bizarre sequences. It's like Reanimator in a way. Although Reanimator came a few years after this, so yeah. Right. Oh, it's just, it's just great. And like any of the stuff with Bilal is fucking hilarious in this movie too. It's just because there you can tell there's no budget, and it's this tiny little like puppet thing that they're just mm -hmm. throwing on people, and you know the people have to be like ah, yeah. 
But uh, one, th I, one thing I wanted to bring up is the horrible wig that was on Dwayne's girlfriend <laughs> this entire yeah. movie. I mean, people talk about the wig Jamie Lee Curtis had on in Halloween too. This beats that wig. I mean, it is terrible. Uh, and I read up the reason why she has a wig on is I think she was in a punk rock band and her head was either shaved or her hair was cut really, really short. That makes a lot of sense, mm. yeah. And I have to have a horrible wig, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just subjective perspective, says uh, <laughs> Belial's just trying to get that nut. Oh, God. He uh, so, waters porn films. <laughs> he probably did make some porn films. <laughs> right. I, I don't think I want to see those. I'll stick with this other stuff. Yeah, we're probably not going to talk about them. So, um, the ending of the movie always stuck out to me, though, Dana. I don't know like if it had the same effect on you, but it's actually a pretty good ending for such like a low budget film too so you know you go through the whole thing where as to do I, i'm assuming he's trying to like emulate the same thing that his brother's doing you know mm -hmm. get with the girlfriend and all that kind of stuff um and so all that happens and then Dwayne kind of like you know finds out everything that's gone on and takes Bilal back um to the apartment and the two of them start fighting. Mm -hmm. And basically, like, they wind up with them hanging out the side of the window of the hotel and plunging to the, their death. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, then which I always thought was kind of fitting uh, way for the movie to end. And that mm -hmm. scene, too, where, like, Bilal's kind of hanging on to him, uh -huh. you know, with that claw and everything, that will forever be burned into my mind. Mm-hmm. That's not a scene that you forget about. No. It's a, it's just a great movie. And I actually think, though, Danny, you tell me what you think, though, that a lot of this film, even though it is silly now to look at it, um, a lot of it is kind of, the way that it's filmed and done is really, really competent, and some of it's actually kind of scary. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you suspend your disbelief about some of the bad effects and stuff, I think it actually kind of works. Well, I think there's some very creepy scenes, like um, the first kill of one of the doctors. I mean, there's that whole thing where it's very dark in the house, but he can hear these thumps and bumps and stuff. And at that point, you're not really sure what you're going to be saying. What, who's, you know, going to be doing what as far as the killing is yeah. concerned. And so when this hand finally does come up and goes on the guy's face, I mean, that whole buildup is creepy. And another creepy scene is when the, the dad is going downstairs into the basement of the house and he's yeah. looking for Dwayne and he's saying, Dwayne, are you down here? And like they... Uh, some kind of saw gets turned on and there's that whole creepy scene where you know Bilal's there just stalking the father because of what the father did to him. I mean, they basically cut him from Dwayne and threw him out with the garbage. Um, yes. And so you know that something terrible is going to happen to the father, but you're not as sure exactly how they're going to carry it out the first time you watch it, but that whole stalking scene is is creepy too and i think one of the best things they did especially early on in this movie probably for like reasons of like they didn't want to you know because it looked really bad but was not show the whole monster mm -hmm. you know so you kind of didn't know what was going on up until the middle of the film right. you know when it jumps out of the basket but like you know the rest of the time you just see a hand or a claw or something mm -hmm. like that and then yeah so and there was a lot of that too, a lot of behind the shadows kind of stuff done in this movie that was great, mm -hmm. and that really did set up an atmosphere to the movie. You're right, like I mean, it it helped, it helped a lot too. Mm -hmm. And this was the 
the, I guess, mainstream directorial debut of uh, Hen Lauder. And uh, I'm trying to look up what all is on this. Oh, well, I guess talking about some of the the home media releases too, Dana. Mm-hmm. It was released theatrically, by the way, in the United States in April of 1982, where it played as a midnight movie for several years, which I didn't know that really. Mm-mm. Makes sense, but yeah. Most of the uh, reviews were not great, <laughs> as you could imagine. Uh, but one of the one of the ones that kind of got. Um, it got pretty popular was Rex Reed said it's the sickest movie ever made. Yeah. Exactly. Which actually, yeah. You know, that's got to help it too. Oh, yeah, that's another thing too. So the DVD was released by Image Entertainment in 1998. That's out of print. And then it was released by a company called Something Weird Video mm-hmm. in 2001. Now that company, Hen and Lauder actually had a lot to do with that company. And it, we were talking about this too. It primarily released like movies like um, uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis mm-hmm. and old older exploitation style um, movies from sixties, seventies, things like that too. Yeah, I think I actually I don't know if I still do, but I used to have the something weird uh, release of Basket Case. Yeah, I did too. Like, I've got the VHS of it somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe it's the DVD. I can't remember. But it's, I've got, like, one of them. And I've got the... I know for a fact I've got the uh, VHS release from uh, Blood Feast from something weird, too. Somewhere oh, right cool. here. Because I had that signed by Herschel Gordon Lewis at one point, too. So let's see what we got uh, comment-wise here. Uh... The ending, most people are saying this too. The ending of Basket Case is perfect. So much so that I was put off watching two and three for about mm-hmm. a decade. Yeah. I think that that's definitely true. That, that's that got one of the best endings for an exploitation film like that. The The first film is better made. The third is more over the top. <laughs> oh, yeah, no shit. The second film was fairly middling and boring. I don't know. I thought the second film was pretty. Yeah, it was decent. Yeah, second film was like an inferior film, but it wasn't as goofy as the third one would end up being, too. Mm-hmm. And this is true, too. It says, one thing's for sure, each basket case movie gets more batshit insane from one movie to the <laughs> next. Does. Yeah, they just progressively kind of go, like, I guess downhill would be more mm-hmm. yeah, of a trajectory. But... Yeah, Basket Case is a classic. Like, it's got to be. It's got to be one of the unsung classics of the 80s, you know. I think if somebody asks you what's, like, just this crazy horror film that they can start out with to watch, I would definitely recommend Basket Case to them. I mean, that's a movie that everybody needs to experience at least one time. Oh, I definitely agree, yeah. Like, it's... In in my era, which is a long time ago, it was kind of like a rite of passage to to mm. watch that movie and be freaked out by it. Uh, it does have a Blu-ray, um, which is this Arrow mm-hmm. uh, Blu-ray. And I thought, and we were talking about this, that Synapse had released that, but they didn't. They released the sequels, but they did not release right. the original. So, that is Basket Case. And, you know, I imagine anybody watching this has probably seen Basket Case. Like, it's a damn classic. Oh, yeah. So, let's see, Dana. What comes next? It, would it be Brain Damage? Is Brain Damage next? Or is it I... one of the Basket Case sequels? Uh, not sure. I looked I'm these look up it. before, but I want to look it up. When did Basket Case Two come out? Huh? Brain Damage came out in '87. I know that. 
No, Bass Case took him out in 90, so it probably is brain damage then. Oh, okay. So, if, in my opinion, if Henry Lauder is an underrated director, then this is probably like his most underrated film. Mm hmm. Um, just. Uh, yeah, so Basket Case is next. <laughs> Or brain damage is next. Mm -hmm. So here we go. So this came out in eighty eight. I think it was mm -hmm. made in eighty seven. Came out in eighty eight. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see this until years and years. You know after. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't it, remember it watching this. It took me years too. Yeah, I don't remember like having a, a VHS kind of memory of this particular movie. But I do remember reading about it in Gore Zone magazine because um, I remember getting an anniversary issue. I know I've talked about this before of Gore Zone, and they were they had one article where they were talking about a bunch of different movies um, that primarily had gross out scenes in them, and Brain Damage was one of those that they brought up. And I remember being intrigued by it, uh, but then I still didn't watch it until many years after I read about it in the magazine. Yeah, Brain Damage is just one of those movies that it uh, slipped under the radar for a lot of people, I feel like. It wasn't as popular as either Basket Case or Frankenhooker. Mm -hmm. I guess Frankenhooker was really all insane it is but uh and basket case because of like kind of how like it took everybody by surprise but right. brain damage is that middle film uh i think honestly that it's his best made best looking film yeah i would agree with that too it seems uh, it yeah. seems a little more polished than basket case and even frankenhooker yeah, it seems like it the the just the production quality is a lot better than those movies, and the the acting and stuff it seems to be a little bit better, and just the overall just everything about the film see a little bit, you know. But so you know, it's it's hard to talk about this movie without saying that it's clearly about you know drug use, really, like the dangers of of drug use. Uh, and I'm assuming it probably comes from his own life because, uh, you know, cocaine was really, really prevalent at that time period. It seems like we talked about this with either him or Gabe Bartolis or somebody like mm -hmm. that. And th th that was kind of like they were all going through their own demons and stuff around that time period. And this is kind of a an indictment of drug use and or maybe not an indictment per se, but definitely like a journey about what it was, what it was like. So, mm -hmm. you know, brain damage is, uh, I just watched this movie yesterday. As a matter of fact, it starts out with like, and I didn't remember this at all, but it starts out with like a whole other couple has Elmer mm -hmm. and they're taking care of him. And, you know, he's like this little slug like <laughs> creature. Right. Looks like a turd really. Who, <laughs> who turd with eyes. <laughs> yeah. Who, you know, you don't really know what's going on, but you know these two these two older people are taking care of this thing, mm -hmm. and it gets loose and leaves them, mm -hmm. and then like in this apartment complex, and then ends up at you know the the main protagonist's apartment where it latches itself to the back of his neck, mm -hmm. and within like a day or two, then the the older couple is dead. They have like a that shows them kind of like overdosed, basically. Mm -hmm. Or whatever that would be like. Some sort of weird withdrawal. Uh, so the main character in this film is Rick Hurst. Played by Rick Hurst. His name is uh, Brian in the film. Yeah. And uh, this is the best part, though, to me. Uh, so little, little Elmer talks. like He's got this amazing voice. Mm -hmm. And I had yeah. forgotten that Zachary did the voice of Elmer until somebody yeah. uh, 
reminded me. Scratch actually brought that up in the chat. Yeah, just like one of the best ideas, by the way, for a, a voiceover <laughs> in any horror film because it's just like, oh, hey, Brian. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? Like that's the way that he talks. To, right. He's like, he's like, you'll never need anyone else but me, mm-hmm. and all this stuff like through the whole thing, which is you know, so much about drugs where it's just like nothing else matters but the drug, and he's trying to convince right. him that you know, he doesn't need anything else except him. So okay, so a little parasitic dude latches onto the back of the neck, and then basically gets Brian to just take him to different places Mm -hmm. where he attacks these different people and eats their brains Mm -hmm. and that's kind of you know that's kind of plot of the movie like so he will he will keep injecting him with this pleasure serum Mm -hmm. you know from the back of his neck he's got like a little tentacle thing that comes out and like shoots Mm -hmm. this drug into his brain and if he keeps getting him these these fresh people to kill he'll he'll just keep on shooting him up Mm -hmm. so to speak uh, one I know you probably have to remember this scene is uh, the very first time that he kills somebody in front of him it's like I forget who it is what the guy's job is or whatever exactly yeah. now is he like a bodyguard or a bouncer or something like that I can't remember maybe I for some reason I can't clearly remember either but anyway, he like shoots up, like goes into the center of his forehead and then kind of burrows into his brain. And then, but then when he's eating his brain, he's like, uh, <laughs> he's talking to him, you know, he's like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, you know, nothing. You're just, you know, whatever it is, this, this, that. And because at that point, like he's so high that he can't even see really what's going on. Right. He just sees like colors and shapes and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but that interaction between the two of them is just freaking hilarious throughout this movie. And that voice is like the most perfect voice to come out of that little creature. Yeah. I wonder how much they paid Zachary to do that. <laughs> That'd be a good question. I mean, it's it's kind of classic though, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, just that, that voice and everything. Um, right. Just the way that it's done is so amazing. Uh, but what did you think about this movie though, Dana? I mean, just in general, what are your thoughts? Um, I mean, it's, it's different than basket case, but it's still got the hen and lotter stamp all over it. Um, but it just, it almost, I mean, it's got hen and lotter stamp, but you could almost imagine that it might've possibly been done by another director. Uh, just because of some of the directions it goes in. Um, but overall, I mean, I, th- I enjoy it. It's, it's just crazy enough to keep you on edge the whole time. Uh, yeah. Wondering what Elmer's going to do next or what, what is he going to have Brian do, <laughs> do next uh, to get his fix? Because I, in there a couple of scenes where Brian like basically says, "I'm not going to do this anymore," and it, and Elmer kind of like disengages from him, and then he has like super withdrawal. Um, yes, I, I was yeah. thinking there were a couple, at least a couple of scenes where it's like it's literally like a junkie trying to kick the habit, and he can't. He ends up always going back to Elmer saying. I need you, you know, I need whatever this juice stuff is that you've got. So, yeah, really, really good movie, uh, but it has a lot of social commentary to it as well. It really does, and it's it, it's honestly, like, for a movie like this, a lot kind of deeper than you would think, like, a movie like that would go, mm-hmm. where it's talking about, you know, withdrawal and drug addiction and, like, how you'll give up everything and and do whatever to get that next fix. And then, you know, and that's the thing, like towards the end of the movie, like he tries to withdraw off of the, off of the little creature. And of mm-hmm. course that, like, that's like the end of the movie, really. Right. You know? Um, and it's kind of like heroin 
you know, I think that's yeah. what they were going for was like heroin mm-hmm. withdrawals. That's kind of the, the feeling that it gives you too. But I think the most famous scene from this movie, and you have to know what I'm getting ready to say because mm-hmm. I mean, the most famous scene from this movie is when like little Elmer like gets into the pants <laughs> of Brian, I guess. Yeah. And then he's with this girl and like they're getting ready to, you know, do whatever. And then he like mm-hmm. shoots out of there <laughs> and right. like goes up. <laughs> That's that's very reminiscent of every other thing that that Henlotter would do, like that mm-hmm. kind of crazy, you know, just the off cra- the wall stuff. The craziest, uh, it, I think Ken and Lauder must have just sat in a room by himself or something, and thought, "What's the craziest thing that could happen when somebody's either about to have sex?" Or they're having sex, or they've just finished having sex. What's the craziest thing I can throw in here? And then he actually does that, uh, and I think he does that in pretty much all of his films. Yeah, yeah. I think that you're right, though. He must like sit around and just be like, okay, like what can we do that would absolutely like shock and horrify people? Yep. And that's that. But you know, that's a true exploitation style film, though, really. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're exploiting some sort of concept that's over the top, you know. And I think he, even Henlotter himself said he he he's not a horror filmmaker. He's like an exploitation filmmaker. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the Forty Second Street stuff is kind of what he wants to be known for because that's mm-hmm. the kind of stuff that he loved too. Um, so I think it's a great film. I think it's it's funny. And gory, and actually has like a pretty good, you know, metaphor plot kind mm-hmm. of thing going on there. Um, it's got the perfect little creature yeah. that I think you know maybe not as great as Bilal for some reason, but as you know, as creatures like that go, it's pretty damn memorable. Mm-hmm. Really, I want I want somebody to make an Elmer, like make a puppet or something. Of Elmer, and I would buy it. Yeah, that should be. Now, if I'm not mistaken, the movie at one time, like one of those versions came with a little Elmer pin. Oh, yeah. Like that you could get or something like that. And uh, I remember that too. So let's see, let's get some comments here real quick. So Jake says that uh, Brain Damage and Frank and Hooker both weave social commentary into the story. The former is more explicit about it, yeah. Mm-hmm. So Douglas says, sad for sure. It hits too close to home, honestly, with a lot that's happened to my family and friends and me too. Yeah, I mean, it hits close to a lot of people, really. <laughs> and... Some of the effects are pretty cool, especially the light shining on the head at the end. Yeah, so that was a big part of it, too, was the whole, like, the trip that they go on is basically, like, all this, like, light, you know, mm-hmm. and everything becomes, like, hyper, you Right. Know. Now, is it just me, or, because I know you like David Lynch's stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. Did you see any similarities between David Lynch's stuff? I mean, I'm talking about his really way, way out there stuff. Uh, in some of the uh, trip scenes, like yeah, stuff like that. I could see a. I don't know if you would call it a David Lynch influence or what, but it just seems similar to some of uh, David Lynch's stuff that he had out. Like, I mean, something like a racer head, even um, some of that weird imagery that was in a racer head. Yeah, there's a lot of nonsensical it. kind of uh, <laughs> just like imagery interspliced in the in the movie too, mm-hmm. that I could see like that, and the lighting and everything too, mm-hmm. um, because I mean, some of it kind of reminded me of like uh, some of the camera work reminded me of like in Predator where you could just see like reds <laughs> right. and like greens and stuff like yeah. that. Like it was so kind of heightened and and but Lynch, you know, yeah, he had a lot of non sequitur kind of stuff like that too. Mm-hmm. 
So I think anytime anything like that is like a trippy, nonsensical kind of thing, it puts <laughs> right. me in mind of David Lynch, really. Right. Uh, so let's see. This movie was released, Dana. Uh, theatrically, it was released in, I can't believe it was released in theaters, to be honest, but it was and premiered April 15th, 1988, later released in by Synapse on DVD in 2007, which would have probably been around the first time that I saw it, and then by Arrow, which is the version I've got over here on Blu-ray in mm -hmm. 2017. Um, so it looks like it was initially kind of ignored and then gained a cult following, which I'm pretty sure is like all of his films, so that's not surprising. <laughs> But this has like a million different special features on it too. Oh yeah. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but needless to say, it's got making of effects, um, commentaries out the ass. Uh, da, da, da. and there was a special version of this too, which I don't own. It had the pin, I think, that came with it. This is just a more recent, more recent version. Yeah, I wish I'd gotten the version with the pin, but I did. Yeah, I feel like that one was probably sold out pretty quick you know mm -hmm. so guess what's next we were just talking about it Ooh, that's so in, in 1990 two movies came out oddly enough i don't know mm -hmm. but basket case two and frankenhooker both came out in 1990 what are your memories of Fra or frankenhooker basket case two <laughs> um I want to say that Basket Case 2 was another one that maybe I rented. Um, I'm pretty sure that I, I rented it. Um, but this one, I didn't have my parents watch it. I only had to watch the first one. So, um, But I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I recall this one being a slightly tamer uh than basket case and that's only because what i'm remembering is it wasn't it more about um their aunt or something being with them or Gra granny ruth yeah granny ruth yeah that she was the main kind of i don't want to say she was the main focus of the film but in a way kind of yeah i mean she was like the the character that they were pushing in this film too Uh, so it was less about Bilal and Dwayne running around New York City killing people and more about their relationship, I think, with Granny Ruth. That's my recollection. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I think she did a great job, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Granny Ruth, I'm trying to remember who the hell played her. Annie Ross, that's who played her. Oh, yeah. yeah. And... Uh, so in this one, Dana, like the idea is that um, they survived the fall, which would mm -hmm. never happen, but they did, <laughs> um, both of them, and they're rescued from the hospital by Granny Ruth mm -hmm. and her granddaughter, who are their caretakers, by the way, mm -hmm. and um, but it's like a home for I don't know, like mutants, basically, mm -hmm. like before the X file or the before the X Men, the X file. <laughs> This was the original, like, X-Men mansion was oh. <laughs> Granny Ruth. But these mutants are more of, like, the kind of, like, not superpower mutants, but just, like, hideously kind of deformed mutants. Mm -hmm. Do you remember some of them? Because I still do to this day, like, some of the designs, I guess. Yeah, they were um, interesting, to say the least. <laughs> uh but I I think that just shows like how much creativity Hen and Lauder actually had to come up with these designs because you know that the special effects people have a lot of say in this stuff, but you know the director has to give them a vision to work from. So I'm sure all this stuff originally came from Hen and Lauder's mind, uh, and then the special effects people took what. He envisioned and said, "Hey, this is what we created. 
you know, do you like it or should we go back and work on it again? Uh, so I don't, I, <laughs> I don't know what kind of things were probably floating around in Frank Hanawater's mind when he was creating all this stuff, but we probably don't really want to know what was floating around in his mind. No, but. no. Probably a lot of cocaine if I was <laughs> guessing, floating around in his mind. <laughs> but, you know, the the thing about this movie, too, is is that the tone of this movie is 180 degrees like different than the original Basket Case. This movie's really a comedy. Like, mm -hmm. it's just a straight-up comedy that has some like horror elements in it and i like this movie like i really do i always have like i thought it was to me it's like this perfect example this is like this movie is the basket case like sleepaway camp 2 is to sleepaway camp mm -hmm. like they're exactly the same like they just go completely over the top and focus more on like the the goofy kind of characters and the the craziness of it and whereas the originals of both those movies were gritty kind of like just nasty exploitation mm -hmm. films these are more like your horror comedies that would become right. like a lot more popular at that time uh, that being said this movie's got like a, a two and a half million dollar budget which i'm not positive but that's got to be close to the biggest budget hidden lauder ever got oh yeah and i imagine most of it went to creating these uh Creeps. Mm -hmm. What the fuck? Garrett. I'll tell you what? what. I'll tell you what. Garrett says, I see what's going on here, Uncle Bill. I'm on hold from stream with <laughs> yeah. That's right. Until we figure out what the fuck's going on. Until you win this contest, which by the way, everybody on here right now should know to go vote for, if you haven't already, and most people here probably already have, vote for Garrett for horror youtuber of the month and it's there's some link garrett can put it up on here it's like tiny url tiny url vote born to be rad something like that mm -hmm. but but if you haven't done that i'm gonna i'm gonna put the link up here in a second when he puts it on there <laughs> um but basket case two is a i, li I like the movie it's not as mm -hmm. good to me as the original like there's something about the original which did, now here's a good time to ask you this, Dana. Okay. Because this this is kind of similar in my mind too. Which one did you like better, Evil Dead or Evil Dead Two? Because I think the Evil Dead Two is a little goofier than. Okay, Evil I Dead. guess. Well, here's the thing: when I watched the first Evil Dead movie, I watched was Evil Dead Two, and I have great memories of watching it with my aunt who was like one of my horror movie watching buddies growing up because she loved all the same stuff that I did. Um, and I guess that one holds a special place in my heart because it was the first evil dead I saw. Um, I remember what I was eating when I was watching that. And I remember my aunt trying to cover up her face with an Afghan and you know, you can't really cover up your, cover your eyes with an afghan because you got all these <laughs> there's, little, there's holes in it yeah, little, little holes. but i just keep I, I kept remembering her just go oh oh and i never saw her do that <laughs> again with a movie just just that movie and we were eating chili while we were watching that um so i just have so many good memories about it that um it just holds that top place because I have such fond memories. But if if you were to ask me which was the better horror film, I would have to say the first one because that one was so dark. There was no comedy in it. Um, and Evil Dead 2 was starting to get that comedic element in it. And then by the time they got to Army of Darkness, of course, it was just a free-for-all. Uh, yeah, you, you know, yeah. you still had the creatures and yeah. stuff, but you you had so much of that comedy. And then Bruce Campbell was more of a leading man by that time. But he, he was treating the women like shit, but he was still a leading man character in that. But yeah, I'd have to say because of the fond memories of Evil Dead 2, that's probably got to gotta be my favorite. And to me, it's like, you know, if you like Evil Dead 2... Um, 
in the same way, like with if you like Evil Dead Two and Evil Dead, like you'll like Basket Case Two, mm -hmm. and Basket because it's basically the same type of thing. Like this was a common thing. Now that I think about it, that was going on with these directors. Like whenever they got a little bit of money for these sequels, mm -hmm. it seems like they took it in a more kind of like comedic uh, route or something. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at a lot of those movies that came out during the mid '80s that were you know, sequels to those movies from the early 80s. That seemed to be the way they went. I think, I mean, I don't think it was all studio interference, but I, I know I've heard like Sam Raimi talk about during Evil Dead 2 that um, the studios basically told him, we, your blood can't all be red. So that's why he had like black <laughs> and green yeah. and whatever spraying out of the walls and hitting Bruce Campbell in the face. Um, so I guess it kind of forced him to be more creative and add those comedic elements. I'm not sure if the same was for Frank Hennenlauter, though, with Basket Case 2, if anybody was forcing him to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't feel like that any, that the studios weren't messing with any of these films. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just get the feeling if they were, these films probably wouldn't exist, like, I, I for one thing I don't think that that Hen and Lauder is up for that. Mm. Um, now maybe some of the producers that gave him some of the money might have been kind of messing meddling around in it or something. Yeah. I don't think a studio came anywhere into these movies for some reason. But anyway, two point five million is a pretty good budget for this movie, mm. and a, a lot of the monster effects in it are really really good. Was that I don't know if that was Gabe Bartolis. I'm assuming it probably was. I think so. I'm trying to look on here, but it's hard to find that kind of stuff quick on here. Um, I'm just going to guess that that's probably who did a lot of these creature effects and stuff. It's a pretty good movie. Like, it's, it's to me, um, it goes for comedy, but it also has a lot of gore in it. It also has some really good mm -hmm. makeup effects in it. It's just a continuation of the first story. If you can get past, like, kind of how goofy that idea is, then... Um, yeah, I think it's an enjoyable film. Oh, yeah, it's definitely not uh, a bad film. I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, Jake brings up another one, Dana. He said, Basket Case is Texas Chainsaw Massacre 74. <laughs> Basket Case 2 is TCM 2. It's another movie mm -hmm. that went completely like towards comedy. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Colt says he could never get past that they survived the fall. <laughs> it's kind of... Well, that's yeah. horror movie logic for you. You yeah, know, people can survive anything as long as they want to bring them back for a sequel. Uh, he also says, by the way, that he saw Evil Dead 2 first and hated the comedy. Hmm. I don't know how you could hate Evil Dead 2. I really don't. That movie's just so too fun for me. I mean, it, it's just like having this uh, crazy out of control party or something. <laughs> that That's how it feels for me anyway. Rambo says, and I think this is true too, that Basket Case 2 felt like more of a setup to a Granny Ruth mm. kind of movie and not a sequel to Basket Case. Dwayne Blah didn't have much to do. That's mm. true. Like, this was really, I think, more just to kind of introduce that character and that kind of story arc, which would go on into part three. Jesus Christ. Part three. I can't wait to get to that. <laughs> uh, let's see here. So a lot of talk about Basket Case 3. We'll get to that eventually, though. But, yeah, it's weird, though, because I never really thought about it that much until we started talking about this movie. How many movies from the 80s went from, like, a dead serious, you know, tone to the next movie being comedic? So you've got, mm -hmm. you've got Evil Dead, which got more and more comedic as they went along. You've got Sleepaway Camp, which got more and more comedic as it went along, too. Mm -hmm. You've got Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which got comedic in part two, then back to serious in part right. three. And what was the other one? There was one other one that we were talking about, too, um, that did the same, same type of thing that was a movie like that. But anyway. Well, you know what? Um Prom Night, I was just thinking about this. Prom yeah, Night, the first one is is a serious, pretty straight-ahead horror movie, slasher movie. 
And then, then they wanted to introduce uh, Mary Lou Maloney in part two. And there were still scary parts of that, horrific parts of that. But the whole Mary Lou Maloney thing, I thought, was so funny in parts. Me too. And it's a, it's a good example of that kind of trend. So there must have been a trend at that time where the mid to late 80s must have been more like comedic. That must have been what people thought was selling, in other words. Mm -hmm. So like all these directors were kind of like moving everything towards that angle. Somebody brought up Return of the Living Dead. Maybe that was part of like why that got to be. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was Nightmare on Elm Street. Somebody brought, Colt brings that up too. So yeah. Some of the bigger name horror films kind of strayed more towards comedy and I guess. Mm -hmm. All these other smaller ones followed them, too. Speaking of which, the next movie, which came out in 1990 as well, which was a straight-up fucking <laughs> horror comedy, was Frankenhooker, which I own two different versions of Frankenhooker. I've got the I Synapse. Have, I have the uh, Synapse version. And the, uh, yeah. This is going to be tough. It's going to be tough for me to figure out like which of these movies is my favorite when we get around to actually like mm. ranking them. Um, Frankenhooker is fucking. I think it's got one of the funniest concepts of any like of the comedic horror films, which is just basically it's like what if. Dr. Frankenstein made a woman, but he messed up and used like parts from prostitutes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and that was like, and that's all they knew. Uh, you know, the, yeah, that's all that the Frankenstein monster knew basically was like how to be a prostitute. And that's probably what Hennenwater was thinking. Let me make a yeah. movie like this. And that was probably what was going through his brain at the time. Yeah, it's a great simple but hilarious concept and he's the guy that really knows how to execute it too because he takes everything so far over the top that it just elevates this movie to something amazing i was just thinking you know what would be a great double feature is frankenhooker and reanimator i just think that would be just a great double feature you're yeah you're exactly right yeah there there are a lot alike you know i think the the tone of reanimation is a little bit more serious like right. but still like yeah like they're they're a lot alike too so i mean i kind of gave the plot to frankenhooker away i don't know there's not really much more of a plot to it if you think about it so uh james lorenz who i think is amazing in this movie um i think he might be of all of the uh leading men that Henry Lauder used, he's probably my favorite because he's so eccentric and out there and just goofy in this role mm -hmm. that it made it. But it's it almost it like he doesn't, like he's deadpan in a lot of ways. Like he doesn't even yeah. realize how goofy he is. He, yeah, it's that's almost the, that, as if he thinks he's normal and everybody else is goofy. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. The fact that he doesn't like acknowledge how crazy the situation is and some of the stuff that he's saying is like some of the some of the best things about the movie too. Mm -hmm. Um but there I guess there is a bit of a plot to the movie, not much. Uh <laughs> but so he's a scientist from what I can recall. Mm -hmm. And um his girlfriend dies in like a freak uh, lawnmower accident <laughs> yeah. in the beginning of the movie, which is a great scene too. Mm -hmm. And so he just decides that he can bring her back to life Frankenstein style. And he, he wants to make her like a new body. That's like this perfect body. So he goes to New York, which New York's in this movie as well. And he puts together, um, this new body made out of the parts of these prostitutes. Now the, the best part of this movie in my mind and will always be is how he gets those parts, which is one of the funniest damn scenes. 
it's just perfect. So he gets super cracked, Dana. <laughs> he goes out. He goes out, or he makes it, doesn't he? That's what it is. Yeah. Like he doesn't buy it. Like he he's makes. He's got his crack. own like meth lab or something. He's making this super crack. Yeah, which is this like really highly, you know, powerful version of crack, and all these hookers <laughs> like use it, smoke it, whatever. And then they just explode. It's exploding hookers. That's which the way they film that is fucking hilarious too. Where they just had like, you know, you would see the actresses kind of just do their like, oh, and then it would cut to like what was clearly a dummy, completely steel that would just <laughs> explode. You know. Oh my god, that whole scene, that whole scene is just one of my favorite things ever made <laughs> favorite things on film anyway the exploding hooker scene mm -hmm. anyway so um i guess the main heel or you know antagonist in this movie if you want to say that is uh the pimp of these mm -hmm. women zorro and uh he finally kind of figures out what's going on in you know in the film and and what this guy's doing what uh james lorenz is doing and there's kind of a showdown at the end of the movie which is a little bit silly i don't the ending of this movie is the main ending of this movie to me is a little bit goofy mm -hmm. um so i don't really care about the ending of the movie though everything that leads up to this ending of this movie is all fucking amazing Mm -hmm. I don't know though. What are your what are your opinions on that? Um, well, I definitely say the exploding hooker scene is worth the price of the movie in and of itself. You could hate every other part of the movie and you'd still get your money's worth in that one scene. Um, I have never seen a movie that had other than this one that had exploding hookers. Um No, was, you just you don't you don't see that enough. <laughs> it was like if David Cronenberg had made scanners with hookers and like had exploding heads, but they were all hookers, that's what this <laughs> it was so... that's a comparison I make in my mind to because right before they literally explode, it does remind me of scanners a little bit. Yeah. Especially the one guy in the that main scene that his head just explodes <laughs> because he's just like, like yeah. this and then his head just explodes. <laughs> just the way they did that too was just the cutaway and then back to like what it's a dummy or whatever and it just explodes is great. Oh man. Um, and the other thing about this movie too that's kind of iconic now mm. is uh, Patty Mullen. Yes. Who who played Frankenhooker, who basically just wanders around the entire time. And she can only say a couple of things, but they're all just like, this is the genius of this movie too. So you're going to make a, a Frankenstein monster out of these hookers, right? Like mm -hmm. if they could only barely talk, what would they say? And it's just like a bunch of things that <laughs> prostitutes would say. Just like, want a date? Want a date. Got any money? <laughs> want a good time? Like it just <laughs> keeps repeating. Well, it's, those it's, kinds. It sort of reminds me, I mean, on a different level, because the Stepford Wives, the original the Stepford Wives, uh, have you seen the original Stepford Wives? I don't think so. I don't okay. think I have. There is one scene in that movie where um, one of the robotic women is in a car accident, or she, a fender bender in the parking lot. And then after that, I guess her circuits get messed up and uh, she just, she's at a party and she keeps saying, I simply must get that recipe. And then she's kind of turned like this. I simply must get that recipe. And she just keeps she repeating stuck. the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's another scene where um, Catherine Ross's best friend, Bobby, has just gotten turned into a robot. And she's like, Bobby, what's wrong with you? And then she figures out, oh, they've changed her into a robot. And she stabs Bobby with a knife. And she she looks down and she says, 
Joanna, what have you done? And she just keeps dropping teacups on the floor and they keep shattering. Uh, so that kind of reminds me of the way that the hookers act, or, you know, especially Patty Mullen's character when she's going uh, looking for a date or whatever. Uh, she sort of reminds me of the Stepford Wives, you know, the women after they've been changed into robots. Yeah, it, you're right, though. That is kind of the same, where she's just stuck, mm -hmm. you know, like saying those same times. That's all that she knows or can remember, I guess, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of good stuff over here, though, that people are talking about. A lot of this stuff that I didn't really even uh, I didn't really even know about this movie, too. Uh, it does have a great tagline, by the way. It was a terrifying mm -hmm. tale of sluts and bolts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's see. There's, uh, there's a couple I saw in here, too. Says uh, Jake says, mm -hmm. some of them were sex workers and others were porn stars, but apparently the prostitutes would shit talk the porn stars and <laughs> vice versa. So, yeah, that makes sense. Everybody just bitching about everybody else. Jake also says that he loves the ending. I guess the ending to me, like, um, i just seen that style of ending before like a lot of different times where it's kind of like turned around mm -hmm. on the, on the guy. And it's just like, ah, I don't know. I just thought it had already been done enough. Not to say that, you know, this movie deserved like a fucking six cent style ending. <laughs> still. <laughs> well, you, you kind of expect a little bit more from Hen and Lauder than that. Um, it was just kind of bland for a Hen and Lauder movie. Yeah, it, it didn't live up to some of the others, I don't guess. Mm -hmm. Rambo brings this up, too, and I was reading this earlier. It says, someone from the M MPAA called Hen and Lauder and he, about the rating of the movie and said something to the effect of, uh, your film is the first film rated S. <laughs> and he said, S for what? Like, it, it, it said, thought it was something else, and then it says, S for shit. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, <laughs> It's not that bad, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, as exploitation films go, it's actually kind of like a classic in my mind. Right. Um, so, yeah, that's what it was. He had difficulty getting an R rating because of all the sex. Mm. And he thought S was for sex, but S was for <laughs> shit, yeah. Right. Uh, so what do you think, though, Dana? Like, this has always been one of my favorites of his. Like, I've always loved this movie. Yeah, it's it's up there. Uh, you know, we're not talking about very many films uh, as far as Hannah Lauder, but um, it's near the top of my list. I mean, I'm just going to say right off that Basket Case is going to be number one. I mean, even before we get to this ranking. But then Frankenhooker's still really, really close to the top of that list um, because it's just... I mean, it's so crazy and so out there and so in your face and it has no oh, apologies yeah. for anything in it. Um, and I, th I think uh, when a director does a movie like that and they're just kind of... Uh, basically, I don't give a shit what you think. I'm making my movie and here it is. You can take it or you can leave it. But yep. at the end of the day, I made the movie that I wanted to make. And I have great respect for people that can do that. And I think Ken and Lauder basically does that with every movie that he's ever made. Yeah, I just get the feeling that with Ken and Lauder, like, he really doesn't give a shit about, like, any studio or any kind of, like, mm -hmm. like he's just going to make whatever style film he wants to make. And it, there's nobody that's really going to mess with it. It's just not going to happen. Like, I, I mean, he's one guy that completely is stuck to his, his guns on all this. Mm -hmm. um, and he and, didn't go Hollywood on us at any point in time. No, no. Uh, and, and that's something that I brought up about. I have great respect for Sam Raimi and people similar to Sam Raimi. But when they go and they decide they're going to move out to L.A., it's kind of it like chips away at my heart a little bit because I know what's going to happen when they do that. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest with you. Like, <coughs> I love Raimi, but when he started doing, like, Hollywood films 
it's just like none of them were ever as good as any of the early stuff that he did just because of that very reason that they just all the studios were kind of meddling in the shit and drag me to hell probably got as close to being like a uh you know, early Sam Raimi film, but mm-hmm. it still wasn't very good in my but, opinion. See, but I brought this up before. I know we're not talking about <laughs> Sam Raimi specifically, but I hated Drag Me to Hell because even though it had everything, those nuances of things that we loved in the Evil Dead movies, it had terrible actors, in my opinion, in it. And it seemed like they crammed all this Evil Dead stuff in there just to appease the Evil Dead fans. Um, And I just, I was so, I was excited when that movie first came out, but then after I watched it, I was just so sad. I was like, this is what Sam Raimi has come to. That, and then he started making, and yes, I'm going to see the new Doctor Strange movie. Uh, But then he started making the superhero movies, and I was like, it's all over. He's not going to go back. We're not going to get an Evil Dead 4. And I know we're never going to get an Evil Dead 4 now. Um, and he's never going to go back to that classic stuff that, that the fans love. Um, he's just going to get too wrapped up in the Hollywood, the wheel that is Hollywood, and you can never get off of it once you get on. Yeah, I feel like he's already kind of there. Like, mm-hmm. and I don't give a shit about superhero movies. I didn't even like the original, like, Spider-Mans. Like, mm-hmm. the, or not the, I guess not the originals, but the ones that Raimi right. made. You know what I mean? Like, I just do not, I, I don't get into those movies. And I, now and they have just saturated the market. Every time you turn around, new superhero movie, new superhero movie. And then there's spinoffs. Of that, and then there's television shows, and then there's spinoffs to the television shows. Yeah, I asked Steve, I was like, "When is it gonna stop?" Well, I feel like there's people that follow this crap, like we follow horror films, right? So, and I'm sure that you know, like they look at it the same way, like they have to get into every single little nuance of anything that comes oh, out. Yeah. But you know, as far as like me goes, like I don't watch any of those movies. I, I wouldn't know. Any, I've never watched. Uh, the Avengers, any of those movies, the Infinity War shit. I've never watched any of that stuff. Um, I have watched um, some of the the more obscure ones just for different mm-hmm. reasons. But I kind of pick and choose. Like I love <coughs> Guardians of the Galaxy, and I like some of the Avengers stuff. Um, you know, I like Doctor Strange. I saw the first one. I'm going to see Raimi's. Uh, Doctor Strange movie, but I don't have to watch them all. Um, that's where it deviates from the horror movies. I've watched a lot more horror movies over time than I have superhero movies. Yes. Yeah. And I think that there are probably people that don't ever want to watch horror films. Same way that we have an aversion to mm-hmm. superhero movies, there's probably people that are like the same thing, you know, with that. Yeah. Uh, to each his own, I guess. Okay. But anyway, I was looking this up. And uh, this is kind of depressing. The movie, uh, Frankenhooker, had a $2.5 million budget as well, but made $200,000 back, Dana. So wow. that, was, that was a pretty big bomb, mm-hmm. really. Now, I'm hoping and assuming that they're not factoring in, like, home media and that it probably made a good portion of its money back on home media because I know you remember this. Frankenhooker had one of the best... VHS releases of any mm-hmm. film, any film, period, in that it had like a little one of those push boxes where you know you pushed it and it would say one of the phrases <laughs> that she says <laughs> from the movie. Yeah, I wish I had one of those. I would say that those are tough to find that actually work right. at this point. <laughs> and you'd about have to be a fucking engineer to like probably fix, <laughs> you know, the ones that that don't work uh so let's see here there's a lot of <laughs> we need to do a show on sam raimi that'd be an interesting show oh yeah i'd be up for that so colt says that frankenhooker is okay at best but nowhere as good as brain damage or basket case uh, i'm gonna disagree with that but we'll you know whatever 
to each his own. Um, a lot of people talking about Sam Raimi. It says, same with Peter Jackson. They prefer Frighteners, Bad Taste, Dead Alive instead of the King Kong, Lord of the Rings stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and what about Meet the Feebles? I mean, that. Uh, have you ever seen Meet the Feebles with the the puppets or the Muppets? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I watched it a get, long time to ago. To get VD and... <laughs> Yeah, so I think Frank and Hooker, we're kind of getting mixed reviews on Frank and Hooker here. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. Anyway, it's one of my favorites. Any parting thoughts about Frank and Hooker before we move on, Dana? Mm. Other than if you haven't seen it, you need to see it. Uh, if for nothing else but the exploding hookers. Exactly. I used to have the poster like right over there on my wall. The original one sheet over there. Um, and it's got a big quote from Bill Murray on it. I forgot about that. Like, Oh, yeah. Apparently, Bill Murray, I had read this story. Bill Murray had hung out because he was making Quick Change, that clown movie, I believe. Um, well, it's a bank robbery movie, but whatever. Mm -hmm. At the same time, in the same place as like, Henlotter's making this. And he hung out with the crew and, and Henlotter for a long time during this. And then eventually would kind of like help him out with the quote, which said like something like, if you see only one movie, like it needs to be Frank Hooker. <laughs> which is kind of true. So up next, it's your favorite, Dana. It's got to be. 1991's <laughs> seminal masterpiece. Uh, Basket Case 3, The Progeny, which I don't own. I don't have a DVD. I, I, I know. I think I have it on DVD. I have. I think I have two and three both on DVD. Well, Synapse put all these out, didn't they? And they, they're probably out on Blu-ray at this point mm -hmm. through Synapse. Synapse put out two and three. I know that. So I'm guessing that they probably have a Blu-ray of those, which I just don't own. I don't. I like those movies good enough. I just never upgraded any of the stuff that I had. Uh, so you remember what the what the big tagline thing about this movie is, don't you, Dana? Was something about, like, in this where the little Belials are born? Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is the one where Belial becomes a father. Yeah. And, like, they're really... It's really like about like them trying to protect the family. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, from what I can remember, for and I can't remember why, but um, something happens in the film where the the babies, the baby Belials or whatever, uh, that are still staying with Granny Ruth. Mm -hmm. That's that whole plot line's going on. Um, sheriff's deputies kidnap them yeah and they end up like back at this police station which the best scene in the movie if there is a good scene in the movie is like the the Bilal fight of the deputies <laughs> in the police station where he squeezes the guy's neck you know yeah. until his head like you know becomes like a balloon basically right um it's just fucking silly though yeah it, it it doesn't really have anything else going for it, uh, other than that just that crazy silliness. Um, I can't really remember any really horrific scenes other than the one you just mentioned, and that was so comedic yeah. in and of itself. Yeah, I mean, none of the gore in it is at all like really serious. Like, it's all kind of just tongue-in-cheek, kind of goofiness. A um, lot of lot of freaks in, you know, freak costumes and things like that. Um, a lot of it just looks ridiculous. I mean, it really does. Um, and, and I think because of that, the... The uh, you know I think a lot of the reason 
the film just doesn't look great. It doesn't play great. There's way too much comedy and goofiness. There's way too much um, just silliness, really. And because of this movie, I don't, I don't think he made another movie because of it, really. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding was is that he couldn't ever get financing for any other films except for Basket Case kind of mm -hmm. sequels, you know, after this movie, too. Um, it's just a really, really disappointing mm -hmm. film. And really, I, in my opinion, I think maybe they should have left it alone after part two. Yeah, I mean, they really, they could have left it alone after the first one and just had uh, Dwayne and Bilal be dead at the end of it, like we assumed when we originally watched it. Um, that probably would have been the most appropriate way, would have been just to cut it off after that, but... Um, like I said, part two was still decent, but yeah, I have to agree with you on part three that it's just not, there's really no reason that it should have been made. Um, I don't know. It's just a, a it, it's a waste of good characters, essentially, is what it is to, to put Bilal in the middle of all this silly stuff. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and there's a lot of stuff in this movie too. Like somebody was mentioning her, like she has like a, a musical number in the film, and there's a <laughs> lot of weird, trippy kind of scenes in this yeah. movie that don't make any sense. Where I feel like that um, they were just wasting time more mm -hmm. so than anything else. Like trying it to find scenes. It was just kind of. Uh, I hate to say it this way because I don't want to sound offensive to older people because I'm going to be really old one of these days too if I live long enough. But it's almost like. Have you ever seen somebody that's really, really old trying to walk across the street in a big city? Because I see it a lot here in Louisville. And that's almost what that movie was like. Part three was like an old person <laughs> trying to make it across the street in a big city with their walker. Uh, it just kind of limps along. It, it really does, yeah. It just, it, there's no, like, story to it. And you can tell he didn't have a clear idea of where, what he was doing. He was just, like, taking money because somebody probably told him, okay, you can make another Basket Case movie. Mm -hmm. You know, it made, the last one made some money. So, I mean, Basket Case too. So just, you know, run with that idea. And he really didn't have a story. Mm -hmm. Really didn't have any idea of where it was going. And so in this one, you know, he's a, he's a dad. And, and that was, I think that that's probably as far as they got with it. I think he right. was like, okay, so in this one we'll have Bilal having like these kids and then we'll just make up the other shit like as we go along and mm -hmm. this is the kind of movie that you get. Right. Um, it is to me as goofy as any of like the Sleepaway Camp sequels or anything like that. Like it's it's just, if you like those type of movies, maybe you would like it. I'm not entirely sure. It's just a little bit too much for me. Mm-hmm. Like Jack Frost says, it's like as close as you're going to get to smoking crack <laughs> without actually smoking crack. Jake calls it his least favorite Hen Lauder film. Uh, yeah, I was talking about the jazz singing background of Annie, uh -huh. who plays Granny, uh, Granny Ruth. And so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on in Bass Case 3, but none of it's any good to be honest. So, Dana, the last film, mm -hmm. and we are talking about a break here. I want to make sure I get this right. So, let's see. The, let's see. He made that film in 1991, which, by the way, 1991 was a horrible time for horror films, really. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say that probably has something to do with the fact that that type of movie probably didn't do well Not in that either. era. Uh, but he wouldn't make another film until 2008. Yep. So that, that was actually longer than I thought when he made Bad Biology, which I think is his last feature I film. I think so. There's something on here called Chasing Banksy, but I don't know what the frig that is. <laughs> And I'll be honest with you, I have not seen that. It's, oh my God, he actually made, okay, Dan. So he made a comedy. Okay. 
called Chasing Banksy in 2015. That was his last movie. I wish I would have seen that. Yeah, me too. But I did not. So I'm going to have to leave that out. So something else we were talking about too, and I was just trying to be honest. Like, I don't, uh, to my knowledge, uh, I, I have Babology on DVD somewhere, but it's in storage. And I defy you to find uh, any streaming service that has bad biology on it. Yeah, because so I, I look. <laughs> yeah, I mean, nothing. Absolutely nothing. I haven't seen bad biology since it came out on DVD, which we're talking, that'd probably been friggin' 12 years ago or something at this point. So, Dana, what can you tell us about bad biology? Like, what was your. Well, that was basically the only big Hennelotter movie that I had <laughs> not watched. So um, when I knew I was going to be doing this live stream, I thought I better brush up on that one just in case it comes up in the conversation. So um, I did watch it. Um, I, frankly, I don't think this one felt like a Hannah Lauder movie at all. I mean, it had some of his hallmarks in it, but I just wasn't really that happy with the movie. Um, and Steve told me it was, but he, I wouldn't like it because it had a lot of naked chicks in it. But, you know, that's, that's not the case. I mean, I've seen a lot of naked chicks in a lot of other movies and over the years and still like the movie. Um, I just didn't really care for the storyline. The storyline is basically a a chick that's got a, uh, I don't know if you call it a mutated vagina or what, but it's, she basically cannot get sexually satisfied. And when she does have sex with a guy, she usually ends up killing the guy. Like there's one scene early on or she's having sex with a guy and she starts banging his head on the floor. And then when she's, I when, remember she's, that now. when she's done, she looks down and she's like, Oh, I'm sorry. And there's like blood running out of <laughs> the guy's head and he's dead. And uh, so she, she does this several more times. She gets angry with another guy who she thinks really cares for her, and they have sex. And she's like, can I see you again? And he, he just gets up and puts his pants on. He says, yeah, sure, whatever. And so she beats him to death and kills him because he, you know, he really is like, I can take you or leave you. You know, I'm not really that passionate about you anymore. Um, so there's all this stuff. Plus, she's a photographer. But I don't know what, I mean, I don't know if it's ever explained what magazine or whatever she works for but she basically takes these odd pictures of like a woman with her top open and her breast showing like licking an old man's face and stuff like that and plus she's got these pictures of these guys like that she's having sex with but the pictures are blurred and stuff and it almost looks like they're in the process of dying so she brings some of these pictures to her boss and he's like, you know, we can't use these, right? Uh, so, uh, I, like I said, I don't know what magazine or whatever she's supposed to be working for or ad agency or whatever, but uh, it's just, um, it seems kind of haphazard the way the, way the uh, movie is designed, like almost like they didn't know what way they wanted to go with it because it has all these out of control sex scenes where somebody ends up dead. Then about a quarter of the yeah. way through the movie, uh, they really enter. You see one quick scene early on with this guy, but then a quarter of the way into the movie, you finally get to know this guy and it's a guy that his, penis is addicted to drugs so he i remember this now <laughs> i swear to god now that you're talking about it like i remember this he literally yeah. has to inject drugs into his penis or it just 
like it's moving all around and it's not like a regular size <laughs> penis by any stretch of the imagination it is huge and it near the end of the movie it actually detaches itself from the guy and goes running around and like assaulting these various women <laughs> <laughs> and then it then it ends up uh ha basically ha the penis has sex with the girl with the mutated vagina and that was the other thing the girl with the mutated vagina would have these mutant babies within minutes of having sex and she would just leave them if she was in a bathtub oh, and it just too, fell yeah. out, she would leave it and it would be crying. And I would felt kind of sad, even though these were mutated babies. But yeah. they still had the uh, umbilical cord and everything on them. And, they, and she left one in a trash can and one in a bathtub. And so anyway, the detached penis ends up having sex with her. And then she gets up pulls her dress up and I guess the penis is dead at this point. It just falls out of her. And then one of the mutated babies falls out or comes out of her and she dies, I guess, because a big bunch of blood comes out. Um, and it looks like a baby from the front, but it looks like the back of it is a, another giant penis. So I was like, so she basically had a, mute, a mutant penis baby. Is what this Jesus. <laughs> so, so yeah, this movie is pretty wild. It sounds like it. I remember some of those scenes though when you were talking about them. Mm -hmm. I but I can't remember like for the life of me the whole movie. Somebody needs to go back to two thousand eight in our vaults and like I know we reviewed that movie. So like, see what I thought about it. <laughs> like, see what. <laughs> 13 years is done, I guess, to like my opinion of the of the film or whatever. But even with all uh, that wackiness, I still think it's probably one of Frank Kenenlotter's weakest films. So it's funny because uh, Jake says that he thought it was a return to form, but definitely not as good as his early stuff. So, yeah. And look at this crap. The Bad Biology Blu-ray goes for over $100 online. Oh, my gosh. So I've got the DVD, but I do not have the Blu-ray. I don't think I'm going to. Uh, Jake says he's done several documentaries. The most re or was 2018, I think is what he means to say. Mm -hmm. Several good documentaries. Uh, yeah, so I mean, this is apparently like one of his nastiest films. I do not remember this movie. Uh, I remember parts of it, like you were saying. I can't remember how any of that stuff fits together. Mm -hmm. so. Keep in mind, though, the version I watched was the unrated version. So if you watch a rated version, uh, it's probably not going to have quite all the stuff that I described in detail. So now comes the moment of truth, Dana. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to sit here and think of this myself, too, because I really... I'm struggling like with some of these movies, but I, starting with number five, let's do this. We'll both do like our top five. We'll okay. start at number five. I'll give mine. You give yours. We'll just, we'll do it that way. So we're getting ready to rank these. Um, I'm going to bring up my little notepad thing here real quick. So I'm going to try my best to, because some of these I feel like are almost as good. Like there are a couple of them that at any given point in time could be my number like one or number two. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually more so than anybody else. Like I like most all of his early films. Um, so this is going to be really tough. So I'm going <laughs> to, I probably should have done this earlier, but I'm going to real quickly try to rank these. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. This is tough, Dan. A lot tougher than I thought. This 
So, okay, what would you put as your number five? Number five. Um, <laughs> probably my number five would probably be Basket Case 2, maybe. Yeah. All right. I, I will... Uh... I'll concede to you that that's a pretty good choice, I think. I think that... I wish I would have gone back and watched Bad Biology if I could have found it on anything. Because I think, just because I haven't seen it in mm -hmm. so long, it's probably not even going to be on here. So I'm going to put Basket Case 3 as my number 5. Uh, Basket Case 3 is goofy and stupid, but at least it's still like got the same characters and still kind of like has some has some charm. Mm -hmm. So, what would you put as your number four? Number four, probably. Well, I may be leaving one out here. I may have to put part three as my fifth choice because and part two is my fourth choice yeah that's what i, I would yeah because i was miss i was leaving one out there so yeah so all right I guess. so yeah my number four would be basket case two as well mm -hmm. uh it's a great movie <coughs> um it's not. It's not really a bad. Like none of these top five are are a bad movie, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but Basket Case Two is. It starts off with a stupid premise, which is that they lived, but it actually from there gets pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Wes Wes would also like us to know, buddy. Fuck you, because Basket Case Three is classic. <laughs> I don't. Okay. I don't think it is, but okay. Uh, Phantasm Matt says, I didn't know he was in here, that the name Belial in Basket Case is sort of a biblical name that is associated with the devil, I believe. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right, now this is where things are going to get weird, I would bet, Dana. What's your number three? Three is going to be brain damage for me. All right, so my number three is Basket Case. Really? The original wow. basket case. Wow, okay. And keep in mind this is a movie that I grew up with. Like I've seen this right. movie probably like as many times as like Dawn of the Dead or any of those movies. But I think this was like a first kind of attempt. You know, it's like the, his earliest film is like the first kind of and there's so much of it that's kind of like so kind of new and low budget that it just kind of doesn't hold up as well over time as these other two that I'm thinking of too. Mm -hmm. But why did you pick brain damage number three though? There's a lot of people look here. Um, putting... Well, you know, if he had never, I'll just put it this way. If he had never made Frank and hooker, then brain damage would have been further up on the list. But, you know where I'm going with this, don't you? Yeah, where yeah I, think I, I think I got it. <laughs> uh, so I'm just saying, if Hen and Lauder had never made Frank and Hooker, this would have definitely been further up the chain uh, than it is. I totally, I totally see where you're going. It, it's, mm -hmm. I can see how you got there. I really can. Um, so my number two would be brain damage. Um, because going back and watching it again, like I was like, this is, this movie is just great for what it is, what it was trying to do. It's like the perfect, it doesn't like beat you over the head with that kind mm -hmm. of message, you know, stuff, but it's perfect in the way that it delivers it and in the way that it kind of, you know, mimics addiction and things like that too so i love it but and it's got elmer in it so yes <laughs> yes so what i'm assuming that your number two then would be frankenhooker right yep. yep okay and i think the reason 
really a big reason why it's number two is even though basket case had a little bit of humor in it it was really a dark film much darker than frankenhooker and i'm the type of person that if i watch like a really dark film usually if i want to watch something a little bit lighter a little bit wackier by that same director so if i can find that that's what i do and i think that's probably why frankenhooker's in that number two spot for them yeah i can see that too because after that you go to brain damage which is pretty much a, a darker film again it is yeah then definitely the frankenhooker frankenhooker is like his most i think i don't know if you call it light-hearted but like just because well maybe not basket case three might be his most fucking like light-hearted goofy movie you come think of it but yeah frankenhooker's right up there though mm -hmm. um so my number one is Frankenhooker. It, that'd be pretty easy to figure out. Mm -hmm. Just because something about that movie, just the... How silly it is mixed with how great some of the lines in it are. Mm -hmm. Mixed with how like over-the-top James Lorenz and Patty Mullen are. And just that it's not really gory. It's more just kind of like campy and like you know out there but still kind of still gritty and stuff mm -hmm. in parts too so yeah frankenhooker is going to be my number one and basket so, case is going to be my number one yeah <laughs> so i'm curious too like how other people are ranking let's mm -hmm. take a look at a couple of these here the rankings pablo says he's got brain damage as number one well shit where'd it go brain damage number one frank hooker basket case basket case two yeah that's pretty pretty close if you just switch out like the top mm -hmm. i could have gone brain damage with number one really i think jake has the exact same except for bad biology yeah frank and hooker is me brain damage basket case bad biology basket case two Yeah. yeah, Pablo says uh, James Lorenz makes Frankenhooker. Mm -hmm. And Rambo says he put brain damage over Frankenhooker because he felt brain damage has more effective ending. I think that that's true. It definitely mm -hmm. has, a, has a darker ending. Oh, yeah. Uh, and kind of a more realistic ending, too, I guess. And there is... Uh, There's a lot of... Uh, yeah, brain, brain Damage did have a Blu-ray. I've got it. Yeah, it's on Arrow. I've got the Arrow mm -hmm. one. Right here it is, Bubsy. I don't know... Uh, I, did Synapse do one, too? They may have. Maybe. But yeah, Ugh. where do curtain <coughs> calls go? I would figure like Basket Case Three would be his uh, number one pick. Me too. <laughs> Saturn Video puts Brain Damage number one, then Basket Case, then Frankenhooker. All right, so it's mm -hmm. yeah. I think the top three are always basically just you know rotating the same yeah. three films. And we got Stuntman Mark. It's got Frankenhooker at number one. Brain Damage. Then Basket Case. Basket Case 2, Bad Biology. Yeah, it's pretty close. Subjective Perspective. Basket Case, Frankenhooker, Brain Damage. Okay. So Bad Biology just did not make the cut. Mm -mm. In a lot of these. TJ says... Frankenhooker, brain. This is basically the same as mine, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's true. Rambo brings up a good point. It says old Curly Jaws did say Basket Case Three was his favorite. <laughs> See, yeah, I knew he, it. 
He would have too, wouldn't he? Oh, so yeah. Pablo says that uh, Synapse did do a Blu-ray of brain damage, which I thought that they did for some reason. I don't know why the hell I don't own that. Oh, so this has been this has been a lot of fun though. Mm-hmm. Talking about hen lauder. Uh I'm glad everybody showed up. It's been awesome as always. Ranking movies is my new thing, man. <laughs> Pretty soon I'm gonna rank uh people that rank movies. Just to be different. <laughs> I'm gonna rank people's rankings of movies. That's the next thing. Look at this, Dana. Look at this some bitch just trying to start shit in here. Oh man. Basket case three is better than night three. <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> You know, I've never been a huge fan of Nightbreed. I know that's... it. Nightbreed's just okay to me, to be honest. Yeah, it is it is basically... <laughs> think about it. Nightbreed is very similar to Basket Case 2 and 3. Yeah. There's like a bunch of mutant freaks that, you know, end up living in this kind of protective home for freaks. Yeah. Uh, Uh, some people say Nightbreed is awesome. It ain't really that awesome, let's be honest. It's got Craig <laughs> Schiffer in it. How awesome can it be? That guy ain't worth a damn. Well, Cronenberg, I mean, Cronenberg can make anything better. Throw. I Do you remember this movie, Dana? Alex Winters Freaked. Yeah, I remember it. I, I mean, I remember that I knew that it came out, but I don't remember a lot about it as far as plot and all that. It must have been like, because I saw that movie a hundred times on like when I was a kid on cable. It must have been like on HBO or Cinemax or one of them like just in constant rotation at one time or another. But I remember that movie and I remember really liking that movie. Um and just watching over and over again when I was in my teens, I guess. But, anyway. This was the uh, the Frank Hinn and Lauder perspective and uh, retrospective perspective. Retros- I don't know. what It's one of them. And uh, so I'm hoping that everybody enjoyed themselves and had a good time. Every now and then, I'm thinking about just picking a really obscure ass director and just kind of like going through his films. And, you know, like I said, nobody references him a lot of that much anymore. Mm-mm. But he was he was one of the best exploitation filmmakers, man. I don't know. In my opinion. Mine too. So, for those of you who haven't voted, vote for Garrett. I don't know what the URL is, but I know you can probably find it on his YouTube over at Born 2, the number 2 be rad. And uh, I really want to thank you, Dana. This was short notice. I had to ask you about this yesterday, so I appreciate you like being on. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad that I'm a little more awake than I had been earlier in the week. Probably if you'd asked me earlier in the week, I would have been like, I just can't. But <laughs> I have a little yeah. more energy tonight, so... Yeah, we'll have to think of something else, like uh, some other kind of subgenre or something of movies to do where we rank or talk about, like, a, do like a career retrospective kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, check Dana out. You can check her out on YouTube over at Evil Dead Chick, and she's got her own channel where she, I'd say you won't be streaming that much right uh, now, I, will you? I haven't right now till I... To be honest, guys, to, until I get adjusted to the new job and everything, I probably won't be doing the output like I was doing uh, about a month ago or so. Yeah, which is a shame, but it's understandable, Dana. Like, you got a whole other situation to be dealing with, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right now, that's the more important thing. I'll but, be back uh, at some point on a regular basis, but... Yeah, so look forward to that. And check us out over at uh, Dead Pit on Patreon and freaking Dead Pit on Instagram and Dead Pit on YouTube. Just type in Dead Pit, literally, and it's like the, you know, 
the most popular thing besides the movie. And I, I want to thank. I've, I'm laughing because I saw Brian Petrowski's in here. Metal, <laughs> metal man's yeah. in here. He showed up like two hours late, that piece of shit. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> Look at this. He's talking about my hair. He's talking about all this shit. <laughs> he wants me to do. He wants me to do Jess Franco movies. Can Listen we just here. talk about Bloody Moon? That's the only Jess Franco movie we need to talk about. He's fucking ten cores lights in at this point, or whatever he drinks. <laughs> oh, you know he is. You piece of trash coming here two hours late, talk shit about me. Fuck you. But anyway, <laughs> thanks to everybody that showed up on time. We really appreciate that more than like that other horse shit. So yeah, this is a good idea. Up next, we're going to review all Amber Heard's movies. Oh God, you might have to get somebody else to help you with that one. We're going to review like all, all three movies she's been in. Ugh. Aquaman or, you know, whatever else. By the way, that is some of the funniest shit ever though. That whole court thing that's going on right now. Yeah, uh, I'm sick of hearing about it, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, it's it's pretty uh, pretty funny with her bed shitting. Um, so, once again, thank you, Dana. You're and welcome. check us out over at deadpit.com. And I will see you next time when we do Amber Heard's Top 5 Movies. Until then, <laughs> I've been Uncle Bill, and this is uh, deadpit.com. Bye. Bye-bye. Give us the thumbs up. Up you butt. Like, subscribe. And if you subscribe, here's something else you can do. Once you subscribe, you can click the bell notification, right? And it'll notify you anytime that Dead Pit puts up new shit. Or don't. I really don't give a f if you do. Or I don't. want you to. I want you to. <laughs> I don't let's, care. let's keep our community growing here on I, YouTube. I don't, I don't like it. I don't want you to do nothing. Listen, they need to do that, pal. No, don't you yeah. dare do it. Thumbs up. Subscribe. And <laughs> click that bell. For this video officially, and it's old Curly Jaws has a message for you. Go on over to shop.deadpit.com and go look at their team public store right now. You've got some new shirts like the old Curly Jaws official t shirt, which is brutal and badass. You got the Gummy Gummy shirt. The captain himself on the shirt. The people you got Uncle Bill's face on a fucking shirt. You got the final girl shirt. You got all these shirts over at chop.deadpit.com. Get them before they're all out, especially the new one, Bedtime 1039. It doesn't get better than that, so go on out. Check out these shirts at chop.deadpit.com. Go look at their team public store. You're gonna have a good old time. Get them all. Thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. Dead Pit on Patreon.com is the only place to check out a complete archive of the old Dead Pit radio shows all the way back from 2005 on, in addition to the midweek shows and fan commentaries, exclusive podcasts, and much more. Dead Pit on Patreon.com if you're interested. Tears start at only $1.